Okay, it's 12.01, so I'm going to make a start. So good afternoon, everybody. Um, very warm welcome to you all joining us at our Thoughtful Thursday session today. My name is Ashling from Irish in Britain, and I'll be hosting today's session. Um, before I hand over to my colleague and our speakers for today, I'm just going to run through some housekeeping. So this session, like with all our sessions, is being recorded and it will be uploaded onto our website as a learning resource. Participants are on mute and your cameras are off, so microphones and cameras are off. Um, we encourage contributions throughout the session, questions, queries, and they can be posted both in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen and the chat box. So please post all contributions there and I'll be monitoring that throughout. We'll also hold a space for Q&A towards the end of the session. We like to um, email all attendees and guests for our upcoming sessions, but if anyone doesn't wish to be emailed in the future, then you can let me know um, in a private message in the chat box or you can email me separately. And I think as far as housekeeping goes, um, that's all of it. So what I'm going to do now is hand over to Zibby. Zibby is our Quivnet coordinator. She's going to say a few words and then she'll hand over to our speakers for today. All right, so over to you, Zibby. Thank you, Ashling. A warm welcome to everybody to this Thoughtful Thursday session that we're holding at Irish in Britain um, on the topic of the Herbert Protocol and how to seek help um, if someone living with dementia goes missing. Um, we're delighted to be holding this with um, Dr. Mary Tilkey, who many of you will know from Irish in Britain. She's the patron of our Quivna programme around dementia and memory loss. Um, and also, um, a warm welcome to our guest, um, Abid um, Raja, who is the, um, our guest speaker for today from the London Metropolitan Police Service. Um, Abid has worked with the police for, I think he said, over 27 years, which is a very long time and has lots of experience to share, both of um, work within the police service to support people living with dementia, but also um, as um, somebody who's also been caring for relatives with um, dementia as well. So a very warm welcome to you. And I also want to share um, apologies from our other guest speaker, Bernadette um, Gay from the police, who's not well today, but has um, promised that she will, at a later stage when she's better, record a short video that we can use um, and share with you as a resource to um, better understand some of the issues around dementia, the police and the habit protocol. Um, we'd also like to say a big thank you to the Irish Post and the Irish World for highlighting the importance of this topic and um, the webinar today. So I'm going to hand over now to Dr Mary Tilkey who's going to introduce the topic and explain its um, relevance to our Irish community. Hi, good afternoon everybody um, and welcome to Abid and can we convey our um, good wishes to Bernadette who has uh, sadly not been able to be here today but she has been very helpful in, in getting this webinar off the ground. Irish and Britain have been working with Bernadette particularly and the Metropolitan Police to encourage the use of the Herbert Protocol within the Irish community, but not exclusively the Irish community. The Herbert Protocol is a scheme adopted by several police forces within England and Wales. It's in partnership with local authorities and other, other agencies. And it's a simple form that is, it's named after uh, a veteran called George Herbert, a war veteran of the Normandy landings who had dementia. It is a simple form that contains valuable information about the person uh, that can be passed to the police when somebody gets lost or goes missing. It's not just about people with dementia, it's people with other vulnerabilities as well, but our, um, our expertise and our interest today is around, um, is around dementia. I'll talk through the form a little bit later on, but it's one that is completed in advance and it's kept by the family, by family carers, so that if somebody gets lost or goes missing, the information is there, ready to help the police or rescue services, rather than, you know, uh, taking a lot of time and delaying an effective response. 
So it's particularly pertinent to Irish people in Britain because of the age profile of the population. We have significant numbers of older people with dementia who are cared for by their families. And it's always a balance. And I think maybe Abid may mention this as well. We want to keep people as active and as connected to the community as possible. But in doing so, there may be a risk that they get lost or they, um, they go missing and that's very distressing for the family members but also for the person with dementia. Now there's a lot of information about dementia on Irish in Britain website, on the Alzheimer's Society, Dementia UK and many other websites. But I think it might be useful to actually think just a little bit and very briefly about what is dementia. So many of you, I, I'm sure I'm speaking to the converted, but many of you will know that dementia is a generic name, a broad name for a number of disorders affecting the brain and the way in which the brain works. The commonest form of dementia is Alzheimer's disease. And the next common one is vascular dementia, which is associated with heart disease, with high blood pressure, with diabetes. And these are conditions that are quite common in the Irish community and many black and minority ethnic communities. And there are mixed versions of these diseases. Somebody can have some Alzheimer's and some um, vascular dementia. And there are also other less common types, but becoming more common types such as Lewy body dementia, frontotemporal dementia. And there's, you know, they're up to 200, so I won't go into any of those. Dementia mainly occurs in people aged over 65 and the risk increases the older the person gets. So something like one in six people aged 80 and over will have dementia and it's much lower at 65. But there are numbers of people now, there are something like 42,000 people under 65 who have what is called young age dementia or working age dementia. It's really important that I point out at this point, though, that dementia is very individual. And although there are some common features, how they present and when is different for everybody. When we think about dementia, the first thing we tend to think about is memory loss. And of course, that is a major factor in some in most dementias, but not all dementias. But dementia has much wider features, such as it can affect speech, it can affect communication, it can affect behaviour, it affects mobility, it can affect vision. With speech, we may have difficulty finding the right word from time to time. But dementia can affect speech in different ways, maybe not finding the right word, but not being able to express something maybe using the wrong word or making up a word. Some people may be able to express things non-verbally through hand signals and gestures, but other may not. But it can also affect our understanding. The person may or may not understand what you're asking them to do. But the other thing that I think it's worth remembering is that dementia can be very sensitive to our non-verbal communication. If we're angry or irritated or, you know, sh showing signs of distress ourselves, somebody who isn't able to communicate may pick this up and it can actually make them much, uh, make them distressed. So I will come back to memory again, but the other aspect of communication, which is important, is people's behaviour change can be a way of communicating. It's something we all do. If somebody isn't hearing what we're saying or getting the message, we can shout louder. We sometimes shout louder. We may stamp our feet or bang the table like, like children do. So when somebody has dementia, if they're not able to express themselves or they feel they're not being listened to, then their behaviour can change. They may do things that are out of character for them. They may do things that are inappropriate. Some of these are actually to do with the part of the brain that may be affected in dementia, but a lot of it is actually around the way in which people feel, uh, experience the environment and people around them. 
And there's one quote from the Alzheimer's Society, which I say repeatedly myself, and it's worth remembering, is that when you've seen one person with dementia, you've seen one person with dementia. So what happens in dementia? We may notice that somebody is becoming forgetful, repeating themselves, asking the same question repeatedly, losing their keys, maybe missing appointments. I'm sure you're probably ticking some of those yourself now. Um, but people with dementia, it happens far more frequently and they're not always aware that they've forgotten their keys or they've mislaid their keys or they don't know how to use the key when they actually find it. But despite these memory lapses, people can often remember details of their childhood and things that, that happened years and years ago. And the reason for this is because of the way in which our brain stores our memories and retrieves them when we need them. We talk about the bookcase model of memory storage and retrieval, and it's a very useful way of understanding what happens to somebody's memory in dementia. If you think about memory like a bookcase where our memories are, are, are filed, uh, our recent memories like what day of the week it is, what we had for dinner yesterday, who we met a couple of days ago, where we put our keys, where we parked our car, maybe whether we bought bread or whether we need to buy bread. And these recent memories are stored on the top shelf of the bookcase. The things we did in the last few weeks or the last few months are stored on the next shelf down. Things that happened, events and happenings that uh, occurred when we were young adults are stored on the lower shelves going down and down on the bookcase until the very lower shelves, the lowest shelf, contains the memories of our childhood. Now, when somebody gets dementia, the bookcase takes a knock. It wobbles and the books on the top shelf fall off first. So we, our recent memory has problems but we can still remember things from earlier times. So we rely on our recall of earlier memories. And as dementia deteriorates, our memory of times during our adult life, right down until our childhood deteriorate. So eventually we, uh, we may only have our childhood memories and they may go in very, very serious cases eventually. And if we think about Irish people, their younger life, their childhood will be different to those living around them in England who were born maybe and brought up in England. Their mid-adult life, maybe around the time they migrated, they may remember the experiences from the 70s, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, depending on the age of the person. Just another point, which I haven't got time to go into in any detail now, but emotional memories are stored on a similar bookcase, in a similar bookcase fashion. But that's a much stronger bookcase and it can take much more shaking. And although the person may not be able to express it, their emotional memories will be stronger. So they will remember people and things that are very important to them emotionally. So although your parent may not remember your name, if they've got a good relationship with you, they'll actually remember that you're, uh, you're somebody who's very kind, somebody that they feel secure and they enjoy being with. So I think that's a very simple model of what happens to memory. And hopefully um, it'll give you some understanding of some of the questions that are asked in the Herbert Protocol. And I'll come back to that in a while. But I think at this point, I'd like to hand over to Abid, who will talk about his father, who he cared for for about 12 years when he had dementia. And Abid's father went on walk about very frequently. So I think over to you, Abid, if that's OK. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Um, <clears throat> good, good uh, afternoon, everyone. Um, 
Oh, obviously, Mary spoke more from a from a um, medical practitioner's perspective. I, I can only speak from my experience as as live as living with um, Alzheimer's with my parents, and also as a police officer. Um, slight sort of perspective on how my colleagues have viewed this um, and and how we try to manage it. Although I've not been in uniform policing for over 20 years, so I'm not sure how they've been looking at this issue um, from sort of borough-based policing for a long time. But I've got a rough idea of how difficult this issue is and also the increase in numbers. Um, when I first joined the police, we never got any input on Alzheimer's or dementia. In fact, we got very little input on, on this type of policing at all. Um, things have got a lot better, so I think colleagues get a range of input from all, all sorts of things. However, um, the complexity of policing nowadays and what we have to deal with, I'd be surprised if colleagues really, um, you know, had very much of of an expertise on, on pretty much anything because we, we are the sort of the go-to body for when things go wrong and colleagues normally will turn up and deal with the emergency. So I think the usefulness of having something like the Herbert Protocol form, uh, uh, I think it is, is very significant. And looking at the experience of my father um, and the way he behaved, and I didn't know about the Herbert Protocol when I was looking after my father, but I, I, you know, it would be really beneficial for me simply knowing that um, if my father goes out and gets lost, at least the, you know somebody has some information. Um, but as as Mary said, I think an important part to take on board, and from my experience, is that it's it's very individualistic. So my father and now my mother, and I've spoken to many of my friends who and, uh, and um, colleagues who've got family members with Alzheimer's, it, it, it really is a very individual um, uh, issue. So, and looking at my father and my mother, they both behave very differently. So my father was constantly trying to get to Pakistan. So he would try to, and my father was always very outgoing in his life never used to sit around at home. So for him to be confined to his house was really difficult for him. Um, but because he was ill, we preferred that he didn't leave the house, but we couldn't keep him indoors all the time. And often he would escape. Um, and it got to the stage where we had to sort of lock the front door to keep him indoors. But before it got to that stage, he would regularly go out and get, uh, and, and go missing. Uh, but he had a very, uh, similar routine so he would off, he'd always turn right off leaving the front door and go to the main road and sit on the bus stop and he would never leave he would never get on the bus but he would just sit on the bus stop so we we sort of had an idea of where to go and look for him also um, because we'd lived in the same area for over 50 years that everybody in that area knew us so again that's unique to our circumstance but obviously other people may not have a similar experience. So everybody knew us and we were able to get a hold of my father. Often he'd go to the mosque. So the people in the mosque would know us and would, 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 would find him. Or he'd sometimes go further afield and go into the Sikh uh, Gurdwara. And again, we're able to locate him. But my father's condition was unique to him and he was very aggressive um, and often quite violent. Now, from a policing perspective, that's relevant because if my colleagues had turned up and they didn't know this, I can see how they might behave and my father could end up, you know, being treated in a way that really wasn't appropriate, but, you know, uh, perfectly understandable if he was be being violent or being aggressive towards others. Um, another trait of my father was he, for some reason, liked flowers. So he would go into all the, all the front gardens in my street had their flowers taken by my father because he would walk into their front gardens and, and pick their flowers or, or, or take the petals off the roses, put them in his pocket and come home and throw them at my mother. Um, whatever was going on, we don't know. But 
the practical ramifications of that, obviously people are going to get upset. Um, somebody who could, you know, uh, attack my father for, you know, for ruining their front garden or their, or their, or their flowers. So the, the importance of having information within your local community, as well as the police, uh, who know what these signs actually mean, that he's, he's not well and, and this is why he's doing this, may well end up protecting my father and also those in the area as well as as well as my colleagues so you know the, the significance of having this information and communication is vitally vitally important um my one of my um my, my mother who's got exactly the same diagnosis as my father she's got vascular alzheimer's um doesn't do any of the things my father did um never really she's only left the house once and my neighbor rang me up who saw her wandering down the street and it's freezing cold and she left the house with um, just her slippers on and, and just uh, her, 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 her nighty on. And, and I, I managed to get her back and she was confused, had no idea what she's doing. But my mother doesn't, as I said, doesn't leave the house, but she suffers from a lot of paranoia and anxiety. Uh, but mainly that's managed within the house. So, uh, you know, the, the, the Herbert Protocol um, doesn't you know it isn't really relevant uh, uh, the local neighbors know about my mother but besides that so for her we can manage that but another friend of mine whose mother has also got alzheimer's she managed to walk two miles from a house in the middle of the night to her husband's grave who, who passed away a couple of years back so again the, the police picked her up in the middle of the night if i uh, you know if they'd known had the information obviously would have saved um, a lot of time and a lot of anxiety for the family and and her so you know um the the the, the importance of i think this this process i think cannot be overstated and, and from a personal perspective if we can do anything that makes the life of the family uh and i say the family because i think the, the impact on the family can be devastating it, it, I mean, um, last 15 years, my parents have pretty much taken over my life in terms of their care, and it's it's pretty much 24-hour care, and it's exhausting. So anything that can make the life even the slightest bit easier, I think, should be commended and should, uh, you know, um, is is valuable. Um, <clears throat> so I, I think I'm, I, I don't want to go on any 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 longer. Uh, I think Mary's already spoken about just the the, uh, the the medical side of how this works. Um, but from a from somebody who's lived it, um, just having any form of help uh, that can make your life easy and protect your loved ones, I think, is enormously valuable. Uh, and, I'll, and I'll stop there. I'll sort of rather talk. I think as a conversation as opposed to talking at you because I I do a lot, a lot of lecturing on on other issues. So. I'll stop there, but I, I just think this is a, a hugely valuable piece of work. So o over to yourself, Mary. Thank, thank you um, for sharing those experiences. It's really helpful, I think, for people to hear about um, different kinds of experience. And both you and Mary have emphasised the um, uniqueness of dementia to each unique individual, how it's very different. The same diagnosis can lead to very different behaviours in different people. I'm going to bring Mary back in um, to comment. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Abid. It's almost like we rehearsed it to, in fine detail, <laughs> some of the points you raised. What, what I want to do now is actually go very quickly through the form and actually see the relevance of some of the information that might be there. And as you say, anything that will help family carers is really important. And doing this in advance is even useful for families to actually think through some of the issues that might affect their relative um, and uh, increase the risk of them going missing. Um, so the form is, you can find it, we will put the link for it on the Metropolitan Police site. But if people are listening uh, or observing from other parts of the country, your local police service may actually have um, 
a, a Herbert protocol. There might be slight differences in it because it is adapted from time to time, but the main principle is going to be the same irregardless. Uh, it, it'll be looking for more or less the same information. Um, so I want to start by actually just talking, um, mentioning the language we use. We often talk about people who have dementia going wandering. And the term wandering is actually misleading because people with dementia generally don't go wandering. They may be walking about, but they're purposefully going somewhere which is meaningful to them. And it's often related to their past life. Just like Abid talked about his dad, he wanted to be out and about. He always, he, he was a man who, who, who got out, he couldn't, he wasn't happy staying at home on his own. And this is true for many people who have dementia. They may actually just be very bored at home. Um, the other thing that is important is that often where they go is related to their past life. They may be looking for somebody like the person Abbott talked about who actually got up in the middle of the night to go to the cemetery to her late husband's grave. There is purpose in that movement. Um, and often when somebody goes walking, it's because of something that has been triggered, maybe a family conversation, maybe they found a photograph of a person, maybe they think it's time to go to work, uh, it's time to go to the mosque or it's time to go to church. They're going somewhere with, with the purpose. And also how they behave when somebody tries to help them is often a reflection of the past of their past life and the way in which their memories are stored. The form requires the usual details like name and address and contact details. But when we're talking about Irish people, if they've got names like Seamus or Sean or Ethna, and I'm sure Abbott has got similar names in his community, it would be useful to actually write down the pronunciation um, because somebody who doesn't understand that Seamus is spelt S-E-A-M-U-S rather than S-H-A-M-U-S can be calling somebody and can be very frightening for somebody. So it's well worth putting the phonetic pronunciation down. The form again also asks for addresses that somebody might go to. And remember, people may not be wandering, they're going somewhere. And like Abbott's dad, there's a pattern to where they go. There's often a very similar routine. Um, they may want to go home. And Abbott's dad wanted to go back home to Pakistan. Many Irish people want to go back home to Ireland. And they may be looking for a bus or a train. They may be looking for the train to Euston if they're from London. They might be looking for the train for Holyhead if they're, you know, in, an, in another part. Um, and when they talk about going home, they see their home that they're living in now is unfamiliar, so they want to go back where they came from. The form also deals with things like physical description and distinguishing characteristics, as you would expect. Um, there is space for a photograph, a recent, up-to-date, preferably a colour photograph, so that if somebody is found rather than reported missing, at least there is an idea that they might have the right person. Uh, they might have somebody there. Um, the form also wants to know about health problems and medication, and also what will happen if somebody misses out on their, uh, on their medication for a particular period of time. And if somebody is diabetic or somebody has heart problems, they may be uh, they may be in danger if they don't take their medication for a long, uh, for quite a period of time. The form also asks about walking about. And even though somebody might be physically quite frail, they can often get very large distances, like the person Ahmed mentioned, who had, who had, who had gone two miles, often in their slippers, 
uh, or in their bare feet in inappropriate dress for the uh, for the for the weather. And it may be that people forget to put their shoes on or forget to put their coats or hats on. Or it may be just that they're used to walking long distances and can actually do that without too much trouble for them. The form also asks if the way in which the person behaves might cause conflict or put them or other people at risk. And like um, Abid mentioned about his late dad, who was aggressive and violent, um, there may be a history of that in the family, but certainly within the Irish community, um, it, it's often uh, within many communities, not just the Irish community, people can become aggressive or violent when they're frightened, when they're scared, when they're being touched by somebody and they feel they shouldn't be touched. The Irish community, maybe who um, who who lived here in the in the late seventies, the early eighties, during the time of the Prevention of Terrorism Act, um, may become very frightened when they actually see an officer in uniform because of a bad experience they've had at a previous time. So it's worth actually remember it, remembering that. Again, people who have Irish people who've been raised in institutions and who have been abused in institutions may be very frightened if they see somebody in, you know, that, that looks in authority or sounds as though they're in authority and may lash out either verbally, verbally or physically. Um, I, I liked, I love the example of um, Abid's dad um, pick, picking flowers to take home to his wife. Uh, maybe he always did that. The rose petals may have been significant in the community. But again, people often do things that are out of character, but it's meaning for them, meaningful for them. They may have some mixed up idea in their head that it's a birthday or something like that. So and it may be something they always did on a Friday or a Saturday or something like that. So um, habits from the past. Um, may may become uh, may come may come to the fore again there's a section on travel and transport and i think that's quite important um abid always he abid's dad turned right and he sat he sat at the bus stop some people will actually get on the bus and it may be the bus they used to get to go to work or to go to school so knowing the local bus stop is, is important. And again, the person may have been quite happy for years going to the shops on the bus, but if the bus stops early or if they get off at the wrong stop, it's actually very confusing for the person and they, they, don't, know, they don't know how to get home. Um, and we mentioned earlier about people wanting to go home and Irish people. We've heard many times of Irish people, you know, looking for where's Euston? I need I need to I need to go to Ireland. And often for a reason as well, they'll have a reason in their head. But it might be a bus or a train or a walk that they go to visit a relative. It may be going to the local Irish club. It may be going to a doctor, a hospital or again, increasingly a cemetery. And for many Irish people, going to church was as important to, is as important to them as it was for, da, uh, for Abbott's dad to go to the mosque. And when you talk to somebody like that, they may say that they're going to church or work or club or something like that, but it may not be the one they go to now. It may be one that they used to go in the past. And on a number of occasions, I've heard of people who have been um, been missing, and when somebody asks them where they where they live, they've given an address, but it was an address of a place that they lived in twenty or thirty years ago, because their recent memory has failed, uh, and their their earlier mem they can recall something from their earlier memory. It may be in a kind of a muddled way, but they do that. There is a section as well on communication, which is quite important in the Herbert Protocol. It asks if people speak English, how good their English is. 
And although you may think it's not particularly relevant to Irish people, it, it doesn't have the same implications as it might have for somebody from Pakistan or India. But Irish people, we, all, we speak English, the vast majority of us speak English, but we speak it with different accents. And we also use different words for, for common things. I think Zibia is learning Irish language now, learning the way in which we express certain things. But there are a small number of Irish people who were born and brought up in Irish speaking regions in the Gaeltacht. And like people from other cultures who have learned a second language, they can lose that second language when they have dementia. And it may feature in initially as somebody is just using some words from their mother tongue, but it may be an almost total loss of that language, either to speak it or to understand it when dementia is a problem. Um, the other thing on the form I think it's worth recording from an Irish point of view is if somebody speaks with a strong Irish accent, it can help if somebody goes missing and is identified and unable to say who they are or where they live. At least they might know if somebody is able to speak that they've got a strong Irish accent and you may say a Northern Irish accent or a Dublin accent or something like that can actually be helpful. I think another thing uh, within the Irish community, I think I, I, feel the, I feel the need to mention is about bad language and swearing. Um, people who have dementia may become uninhibited and use language that other people find offensive. So when stopped by somebody who wants to help them or by an officer in uniform, they may swear at them. Uh, it may be that they use that kind of language commonly anyway, but it may also be a loss of in inhibitions. And sometimes professionals actually get quite upset about that. I'm not saying professionals should be tolerating bad language, but at least it explains it. So I think, you know, that's that's important in terms of language. I think the other thing that the form asks you for is a bit of information about previous times when the person went missing, because for the majority of people, there is a similar pattern. There may be a pattern to it. They're going somewhere um, to see somebody or to do something, and they tend to go in the same direction or on the same bus. So it's quite useful to identify that, identify where they're found. Um, and again, you know, as you get, as the family get to know people and hopefully the services get to know people, they know that it might be worth trying the church or the cemetery or the Irish centre or somewhere like that. Um, and it's useful thinking why somebody went there. It may be that there's a conversation. It may be somebody says it's so-and-so's birthday, so they want to go there. And just a little bit of reflection. It can be quite painful for the family, but can also be quite useful. And it can speed up the response if somebody does go missing. Um, I think the other thing, uh, and again, Abid uh, demonstrated that very clearly, the importance of neighbours and shopkeepers uh, letting, letting people know. And again, I've had quite a bit of experience of local shopkeepers, the little corner shop, keeping an eye on people. And often kind of when somebody goes there and buys something, turning them in the right direction when they leave the shop are noticing um, that maybe they're inappropriately dressed for the weather or something like that. So keeping uh, where, where it's relevant and where it's safe to do so, keeping, keeping neighbours or local Irish community organisations in touch. And also very useful if uh, the family carers have been granted power of attorney for the person making, um, identifying that that has been done and that it's recorded just in case when somebody is found that a decision needs to be made quickly about some kind of treatment or some kind of support. So um, I think I could probably talk for this for about a month, but I think I'll stop at this point and um, answer any, Abid and I will answer any questions you may have. So thank you for that.
Thank you to both of you. Um, so now we would invite um, those of you who are joining to feel very welcome to type any questions or comments into the, um, the chat box and Ashling and I between us will put them to the panelists. I have a first question for both of you really. Um, how um, common is it for people, relatives, family carers to be so worried about the possibility of somebody that they're looking after going missing that they might um, decide to um, keep that person indoors and to, to keep the, the doors and windows locked, for example. Do you have um, much experience or knowledge of people being effectively locked into spaces that they live in? And what are, the, what are, what are your thoughts on that? Um, maybe we'll go to Abid first. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> With my father, and I think for a while with my mother, at night, obviously, I would lock the door to make sure she doesn't leave. But for my mum, it's not such a problem. But for my father, I def we got to the stage where we had to, even when we were home, because he'd be sitting in the living room. Um, and if we were anywhere else in the house, he'd just get up and try to escape. And him leaving the house was was a, a real problem for us because he, he was going to you know, do something that could either hurt himself or, or hurt other people. So it got to the stage where we had to lock the door. To keep it. And, I, and I, my friend who's, I just mentioned that the, um, he, he, the lady who went to her husband's grave, the person whose grave she went to also had Alzheimer's when he was alive in the last few years. And they used to lock him in at the back of the house because he was also uh, quite aggressive and also quite difficult to manage. But um, how that played out for that individual, I don't know. My father was really upset, didn't like it. Um, the, my friend's father would often uh, attack his mother, uh, his wife, so if they'd go in to sort of uh, give him food, once he, I think he hit her across the face with, with his walking stick and she had a big, you know, big bruise on the eye. So it's a difficult thing to manage. Um, but not all, uh, another friend I know whose father has got Alzheimer's, but he's completely placid and is in the garden and does gardening all the time and doesn't speak to people. So, but, but in the case of my, my friend's father and certainly my father, uh, both quite aggressive, both uh, very difficult to manage. Uh, I, I, you know, without much guidance, we were left to make a decision and we decided to essentially lock the front door and keep him indoors. I mean, that was all we could think of. Thank you. And Mary, do you want to comment? Yeah, I think um, it, it, is, it is a very difficult decision and, and it's a balance because you want them to try and lead as normal life as possible. But when they, you know, when they repeatedly go missing or are a danger to somebody else, you've actually got to think about things like uh, locking the door. But it may be that there are other strategies which, which might work. They won't work for everybody. But people often want to go out because they're bored. And so if you can involve them and engage them, and maybe if there is somebody to take them out during the day to kind of tire them out, it may actually reduce that. It may not, it may have the opposite effect, but it's certainly worth trying that. And it may be worth thinking about things like um, hiding the keys. And I don't mean locking the keys away, but actually taking them out of the person's field of vision and maybe taking their coat and their hat out of the field of vision so they don't think about going out. Sometimes in residential homes, what they do is they put a curtain over the door so the person doesn't realise there's a door there, so they don't think about going out quite so much. But it may be just about distracting somebody, but at the end of the day, you might be more distracted than the person because you've had a long day of it. So it is a very difficult balance. And of course, there are security issues and safety issues. Um, if you lock somebody in while you're out and there's a fire, you can endanger their life. So... You know, it, it's a very individual thing. Some people you will need to think very carefully and creatively about it. Others, it may be just the ability to distract or take their mind off wanting to go out and about. 
Mary, I remember a story that you've shared with me before about somebody from a community where the community supported him with his wish to be driving by creating a vehicle where he could sit and, and feel that he was driving. Do you want to talk about that very briefly? Yeah, that was actually, that was a traveller, a traveller community and um, I, I, all travellers, but Irish, tra this was an Irish traveller. They, they want to be on the go. Their life is very much about being on the move. And he would often go uh, missing for several hours, great distress for his family. So what is what they did on the um, on the site where he lived was they had an old van that some of the traveller men set up with um, an old eight-track eight tape in it. And they set him up, they put him in the driving seat and they turned the eight-track on and he would happily, happily drive that for hours on end, sing it, singing along to the music. So it was a way of distraction, distracting him. He was, he was out and about, he was going somewhere and it actually worked for him. The other thing, actually, the same the same man um, uh, on uh, on several occasions, they had had a little bit of help from uh, a voluntary sector organisation and the voluntary sector organisation took him, just walked with him down the field to see some of the horses in the field and spend maybe 10 or 15 minutes there looking at the horses. And he was perfectly happy and would go home after that. So he wanted part of his getting away was actually about going to see if his horses were all right. Um, oh, I think, you know, it's well, excuse the pun, it's horses for courses. Thanks, Mary. Um, I have a question here um, for Abid. Thank you so much for sharing your experiences. Um, and the question is, um, can, can we ask what were the first signs of dementia that you noticed with both your parents? Um, good, really good questions. I, I think um, uh, one of the, uh, a really important part of, if you like, our experience is the, the lack of information. And the, I think the, um, the delay in actually a proper diagnosis. Um, and it, it, again, in sort of Pakistani culture, the, it's, it's a fairly patriarchal culture. And the father is, you know, is sort of beyond reproach. Um, and for years, uh, my dad was behaving in a way that was a little bit weird. Um, but we were all quite, you know, um, frightened of my father. You know, he was, he was very strict, very sort of authoritarian. But he was clearly wasn't well. Um, and one of the earliest indicators was that he would repeat stories um, and he would tell us the same stories over and over again. And, you know, we politely would listen and nobody would obviously question my father's authority. So that was an indicator. And, and uh in relation to my mother, and I think my mother was has had it for a, a long time as well, even when my father was alive. But I did. We were so focused on my dad that I didn't really think about the possibility of my mother having it as well. And my mother, when I'd go, because now my, I've moved mum in with me, but when I'd go to my father's house at the end of um, work every day to look after him, the first hour and a half would be my mother essentially unloading her entire world's problems, usually complaining about everybody else who wasn't there, all my siblings, and the fact that everybody was, you know, being horrible to her and, and the whole world was essentially not uh, fit for purpose. And I would sit there listening and it was, it was enormously exhausting to listen to my mum unloading all of her problems. And I, for me, that was also an indicator that she wasn't well either. And my mum's personality is different to my dad. And even now, the main issue with mum is that she just likes to complain and moan and argue for, for England. So that's, I think, her condition. And she sees things, she hallucinates. She's, she's, she's massively paranoid that things are, bad things are about to happen. And the problem with that is that she normally accuses my wife of stealing her stuff. Or, um, you know, uh, and, and now she also thinks that I'm her husband, which is makes life really difficult at home because she thinks I'm dad now and she thinks my wife has has gone off with her husband 
which makes it very difficult for my wife to look after my mum because she's now she sees her as competition and this horrible woman has essentially taken her husband. So obviously different traits for different people, but I think if there could be more information about just awareness about Alzheimer's and different people, no doubt, will will present themselves differently in terms of how they are ill. But for my father, it was repeated stories. And I think a lot of people I think I speak to her report that their parents have started repeating things over and over again. Um, that was one of the, and also my, my father became quite, quite insular. He wouldn't, he wouldn't, he wouldn't, you know, if I, if I was abroad, I'd call him up and I'd, you know, I'd try to have a conversation with him. He, he just wouldn't want to speak. He'd just say, you know, he, was, he became more introverted. So that again was another uh, sort of in, uh, telltale sign for us. But no doubt, different people present differently. But for my parents, it was you know repeated stories and becoming quite withdrawn. And I, I no doubt, um, I think if there was some a list of I don't know guidance, I think people could start. I think the number of people in the UK who probably suffer Alzheimer's or have some form of dementia, I think is probably huge. But I think an awful lot of people don't understand it and certainly don't know that their relatives are suffering from it. Thank you very much, David. Um, we have another question that's come in for both of you. Um, do you think that the Herbert protocol is helpful to be used in hospital admission? Um, Mary, would you like to comment first? Yes, I, I think the information contained in the Herbert protocol, a lot of it would be very useful when somebody is admitted to hospital. Um, <clears throat> particularly if there is a risk of a person walking out of hospital or maybe, or maybe getting lost. Um, I'm thinking maybe that there is a simpler way uh, which you could use the um, This Is Me, which is a very brief biography that the Alzheimer's Society offer. Or if you wanted something a little bit more elaborate, you could use, uh, and here I am advertising, unashamedly advertising my storybook, which uh, Irish in Britain have produced, which is more of a life history of the individual. I think the information contained in any of these documents is actually going to be very useful um, if somebody has to go into hospital or if there's a new carer or another member of the family takes over the care for a while, that kind of information is going to be, is going to be very useful. So I think the exercise of completing the Herbert Protocol is actually worth it for a family anyway. It, it, it's very helpful. Um, and I think it contains information that might not be relevant to the hospital, but some of the information will actually be very useful. Thank you, Mary. Abid, what do you think about the Herbert Protocol in relation to hospital admission? I, I think um, the more people who are able to access information in a timely manner, can only be beneficial. I would even suggest that, um, and I don't know what Mary thinks of this, but maybe the form, if it's not sensitive, could be shared with local um, community groups like the, the local mosques, local temples, churches, so that the, the, the number of people on in the locality who, who are likely to be wandering, at least they've got some uh, pre, you know, uh, uh, some information and a, and a bit of a for, for notice. Yeah, I think that, I think it, it would be a good idea. To, as you say, it's kind of sensitive. It's sensitive information, but maybe a version of it, um, rather like telling the neighbours, it would actually be very useful. But if, if the family agrees and they're yeah. happy to share the information, and I, and I, you know, unless there's something really, if, if, as long as it's basic information, all you're telling that the local community is that this is a person who's vulnerable, and if they come, if you come across them, this is our contact number. Yeah, yeah. I think it just just to come back to the point, there are there are something like seven hundred and sixty thousand people with dementia in the UK at the moment. So it's just three quarters of a million, and that's going to double by twenty fifty. Um, thanks both. I just have a, another question here, um, perhaps for both of you. Um, somebody has said, at, at what point should a family decide to move their family member to a care home? <laughs> Do you want to take that habit or shall I? <laughs> well, OK, v very quickly. Um, that's a really difficult question for certainly for my community, where 
uh, the the idea of a care home is massively taboo. Um, you you know in a, in our community it's always considered that in your old age you're looked after by your family and and that's how it does work. But I can also report that from my experience it's 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 so um, it's so difficult. And I, you know I'm you know I'm a practicing Muslim. You know for, for me my parents are sacred. But I I would say I probably suffered a, a degree of depression, a degree of mental health um, uh, decline, because 24-hour care for an ill person for 10 years, 15 years, no matter who you are, it, it's it's really difficult, and for the whole family to manage that. And I think you know in the future, with increasing numbers, uh, and not all families are like my family. I've, I've got quite a large clan. Um, I just think it's not possible, and I think it's important that people start having these discussions now, even in my, in, to the Muslim community or the sub-Asian community where it's very much taboo, you simply wouldn't put your parent in, in a care home. But I think it's, it's, if you can manage, fine, but I'm not sure most people can manage because these are, these are, I think, issues that really are best left with professionals. But then, of course, if you... Uh, care homes are incredibly costly, so if, you know you need to plan for these things. And I think now it's a good time to, to, to I think, raise these these important questions. I would I would echo everything that Abid has said, and I think the same kind of taboos exist within the Irish community. Um, and it's very important to start thinking about it now, and maybe not making promises to somebody that I'm going to look after you forever and ever and ever. Um, because it does take its toll on the, on the health of people. Uh, many Irish people, despite the, uh, despite the image of large, happy, jolly families, the, uh, the majority of older Irish people live in single pensioner or, or just dual pensioner households and maybe relying on, on one or uh, just one family member. Even where you've got a big family, the, the, the responsibility often lands on, on one person's shoulders. So it's difficult. I think when the, when the health of the care, the family, that's the person in the family that's caring, begins to deteriorate. It's time to start thinking about that. It's a painful decision and it's made more painful by the community who will actually say, well, I cared for my mother. I wouldn't put her in a home. And they, mm. you know, they lay, they lay a lot of guilt on the shoulders of people who have to consider that. So mm. I think we need much more talk and much more debate about it. Um, and people who do that often find that the person's health can improve in a home because they're getting they're getting stimulation, they're getting care that you weren't able to give them. So it's not always bad news. Thank you, Mary. We have a, a last practical question, Abid, for you, which is what actually happens to the form when a family or a family carer fills in the form? Um, where do they hand it into? And once it's handed in or logged with the police, how can it be updated? Is that it? Or what is the process for getting information updated if the information changes? I think I can answer that in case, in case, uh, Abba, please correct me. You don't hand it in anywhere. You actually keep it in a safe place. You give a copy to relevant people. It might be other family members. It might be a club that the person goes to, but it's there. So when somebody goes missing, you've got all that information there. So you don't have to think about these things when you're distressed as well. So it's uh, you can you can update it any you can update it yourself any time because things may change medications may change the person may be very um, very kind of homebound at one point and then start to go missing or, or vice versa so it's 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 not logged anywhere in to the best of my knowledge it's actually something that you keep in readiness for the day that something might happen. Thank you, Mary Abid. Uh, not, not much to add to that. To be honest, I'm, I'm not. Um, as I said, I, I, work, I work in special operations, so I, I don't know how the local borough is actually dealing with this. But I, I will find out. I was a bit distracted. My, my granddaughter's not well, so she's, she, she's <laughs> making a bit of a fuss. But yeah, sorry. <laughs> 
we're at the end of our time in any case now. So um, we would really like to say a really warm and big thank you for your time today. Um, we will be um, posting this recording onto our website where people will be able to watch again. So please do spread the word. And as we said, we're looking forward to also posting a, a short video from Bernadette from the police as well about um, her views on these issues. Um, thank you to everybody who's posted questions and comments in the chat. Um, and we've had a comment here about the value of sharing stories from different communities, different backgrounds from exchanging and hearing stories across different communities to understand all the different um, um, perspectives and different signs in different spaces of dementia. So, um, thank you very much for those comments. Um, and um, please do visit our website at Irish in Britain if you would like to find more resources um, that we have produced and created together with communities on dementia. And for anybody who may have difficulty printing out the Herbert Protocol form, um, please contact us. We can help put you in touch with local community organisations that could assist you with that if that's something that you would like to do with um, your family at home. So many thanks.